Hey, uh, this is Ryan, welcoming you back to a return trip. We're taking you back to Gaudi's Barcelona. This is an episode we aired a few years ago, talking about the great architect Gaudi and his uh, work throughout Barcelona. So I hope everybody has a great Thanksgiving holiday, and we'll see you next Tuesday um, with a brand new episode on Ascension Paraguay. So until then, enjoy Gaudi's. Barcelona. Hi, I'm Ryan Davis. And I'm Kiernan Schmidt. And this is Out of Office, a travel podcast. Good seat taken. Hey, Kiernan. Oh, Ryan, today... You know what we're talking about today? I'm very excited because this, it, this is an artistic show. It's a it's a it's a foreign travel show. It's it's gonna transport us in place and mind. It, it's gonna feel a color and shape. Do you know what we're talking about? Well, today we're talking about Barcelona, but not just anyone's Barcelona. Gaudi's Barcelona. That's right. We are talking about uh, the artist Anthony Gaudi. And uh, he, he's an architect, uh, renowned for sort of the, 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 the most famous artist that Barcelona's ever produced, a uh, great source of uh, Catalan pride. And uh, we're going to talk about uh, some, of the, some of his most iconic buildings. You and I have both been fortunate enough to go to Barcelona. We're going to dissect what makes his art so special. Yeah, this is going to be a fabulous episode for folks to check out the old Instagram at OOO podcast because we're going to post some of these masterpieces right there on the Insta. Absolutely. Ooh, ooh, ooh podcast. And you're going to say ooh when you see these beautiful buildings. Ooh, podcast. Um, but before we get to Barcelona, Ryan, I wanted to share uh, just a quick travel story that I had that I, I really, uh, you know, I, it was a moment of, of introspection for me. Okay. Um, and, and you know, you know, if there's one thing that comes across on the podcast, it's that I, and, and uh, an Uber planner. Yeah. And, and despite all of my planning, I found myself in Paris in, in somewhat dire circumstances. What happened? My iPhone almost died and I had no way to recharge it. You didn't, you didn't pack a charger? I had a charger. I had a charger. I had an external battery. I had a converter. And still, I, I was almost without hope. I'm confused by it, this story. It, it seems like you have all the things that I, you need to charge I, I your agree. phone. I uh, agree. So wh what, I, what I came to find out was, you know how uh, all these planes that are coming down, they, they, they all come back to a single point of failure, that they don't have redundancies in place, that they right. don't have enough systems backing right. each right. other up. Yeah. I had a single point of failure, which was my, the, the little cube that you plug into the wall, that you mm -hmm. plug the wire into to, to charge your iPhone. A cube. That little cube broke. Well, you can go get another cube at any I any Apple store. In I, the... you, no, you can't. When it's midnight in Paris, and there's oh no I, there's no store. Uh, you know, there's no Walmart that you can go to. They don't uh, have a 24 hour Walmart. Well, what about like a uh, Osco or uh, you know one of these little like Seven uh, Eleven types? I, I don't know what that word is. Uh, so let me tell you what happened. So I'm sitting in my hotel room and uh, I'm buckling in for the night. I got to fly yeah. home the next day. And, uh, you know, I put the, put the converter in the wall. I put the cube in the converter. I put mm -hmm. the wire in the cube. Oh, my gosh. And then yeah. I put the cube in the phone. Mm -hmm. Nothing. Doesn't buzz. No little lightning. Um, and I thought, okay, well, it's probably a voltage issue. Surely this. this well, if you jiggle it. Yeah, I did a lot of jiggling. Yeah. Uh, both of myself and of the charger <laughs> in the wall. Sometimes there's a, uh, you have to hit, like, a switch. I, like I you... tried a bunch of switch. You okay. name it, all the things okay. I did. Yeah. Um, and I tried every different outlet in the room. I even went in the bathroom. I thought maybe that would have a different voltage because, you know, they do things with, like, the hair. I know, I know hair dryers have different voltage issues. Totally. Nothing's working. So then I thought, okay. But you don't have, like, a USB on your, on your laptop? I don't because I have a new MacBook oh, Air. Me too. And they're me so too. thin. They, they they're don't so have USB thin. chargers. Yeah. They're totally, yeah. They're totally useless in a moment <laughs> I mean, like this. This is what I'm saying. It was, it was shocking to find myself with no way to charge it. 
Yeah. So I thought, okay, it must be a voltage issue with with your converter. Go down to the the front desk, and they always have extra chargers, right? Of course, so many extra chargers. So I went down in my uh, non-existent French, and I said, you know, charger. Yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. Uh, oui, the oui, guy oui. who didn't yeah. really spoke, speak English went in the back and he pulled out a whole bunch of uh, chargers that, of course, like people had just left behind. And people don't leave iPhone chargers, I guess. No, he didn't have any yeah. iPhone chargers. They're all like it, Samsung. Exactly. You know, and like it, hundreds of Samsung chargers. All he had was a converter. So I take the converter back to my room, no dice, nothing, nothing fixing. And uh, so I went to bed with 30% battery on my phone. And my phone's old, so it loses that battery like uber fast. And I left it plugged in overnight, and I thought, well, maybe by some grace of God, it'll be charged when I wake up. Wake up? No, it's down to 23%. So oh now my it's like gosh. dire circumstances. Well, I, I go to the airport, though. No, no. I have three hours to go out and explore Paris, but I, I'm not gonna, I, I need to maximize that time, so I'm not going to use a map. And I, I, I had plotted out the boulangerie I was going to go visit. Then I had a park I was going to go visit. Then I needed to call an Uber. So I, it was all plotted out. I needed that yeah. phone. So you rented a car instead? <laughs> so I thought, I had a brilliant idea. I thought, okay, where can I plug into a USB? Oh, there's a computer in the lobby of the hotel. Right. And that's going to have a USB plug-in. I'll go down. I'll check my email. I'll charge for half an hour. Great. Go down. Computer does not have a USB charger on it. So now I'm like really up. God, so many hotels now even just have them on your, you know, in your, on your nightstand. I, I tra- this was not a, a particularly nice hotel I was staying. Oh, you were traveling for, for <laughs> pleasure? By no, I was, traveling for, <laughs> I was traveling for work and I didn't even put myself. I'm even cheap with my work money. Same. Okay. So I'm walking through Paris and I'm trying to keep the light as low as it could possibly be. Trying to right. maximize that battery power. And as I'm walking by, uh, uh, they have one of those bike programs, uh, you know, the shareable bikes in Paris, the rentable bikes, like uh, like a city bike. Right. And I remembered that in New York, those uh, those big Internet, uh, you, you know, they replaced all the telephone booths in New York with like those Internet spots. The, the Internet kiosk. Yeah, yeah. the kiosk. They yeah. have a USB charger on them. So well, that's thought, a new, yeah, but those are in New York. So I thought this is a crazy idea, but I'm going to go up and look. Yeah. at the rent-a-bike station, and maybe that's going to have a USB charger. And sure enough, resourceful Kiernan P. Schmidt, that had a little USB charger, a public USB charger. So I ended up spending the next three hours walking around Paris, and I had to stop every time I found a, a rental bike station, mm-hmm. and I would charge my phone for 10 minutes. I'd read The New Yorker right by it, and uh, I would but get— not, not on your phone, though, like a physical print version. Yeah, physical yeah. print. Yeah. And, uh, and yeah. I would get just enough charge. It would go up like 10%, like 1% a minute. Because, you know, it was a horrible charge. It was like very sure. slow. And I got just enough to see the attractions I wanted to see, go to that boulangerie, get myself a delicious almond croissant, get back to the hotel. Uh, I had enough to get the Uber. And then when I got into the Uber, I said to the guy, you know, can you do a guy a favor, plug this in in your car? He said, absolutely. I got to the airport. I had 70% on my wow. phone. Just enough to make it through to the plane when I could plug back in again. So the moral of this story, and this is something that I tend to do, is yeah. carry an extra charger with. So me. I had an extra battery. So I had an extra battery with me, not an extra charger. Ooh. So you. So my bat, my external battery was also charged. How do you charge the battery? You plug it into the cube, which I couldn't do. So it all came down to a single point of failure, which right. was the little cube. Right. So that's to say, from now on, I'm bringing a second battery i have right. a little uh, i have one thicky thick boy battery now i'm gonna have a, a, a teeny weeny battery that that's gonna be the backup system and oh, I'm backup gonna, for the backup battery that's right and i'm gonna bring a it's backup a of, cube yeah now remember if you had had my suitcase yeah that i designed oh yeah if you folks remember i designed the best that's suitcase, a good point you'd be able to just plug it right on it's in a there damn good point it's yeah. a damn good point yeah. as long as i had remembered to put it back in after the airline made me take out the battery because they're not allowed on planes. Well, you know, potato, potato. I think it would have worked great. Nobody would have noticed it. It would have been fine. Are you wearing a wedding ring? <laughs> I, I wear this ring now, yeah. Why are you wearing a wedding ring? It's not a wedding ring, obviously. I'm not married. It's, it, it, but it it's does. on your wedding ring finger. Well, I don't make these rules. It just fits this, this finger. And it makes me no, feel... No, you're supposed to wear it on the opposite hand. This means that you're married. No, this means that I am committed to the podcast. <laughs> Why are you wearing a ring right now? I like it. Why? 
because I found it. My my bag got stolen in Mexico City, and uh, well, it wasn't stolen. It was replaced with another bag that wasn't mine. And in that bag was uh, some rings, and and this is one of them. I, I'm so, I'm sorry. Let's let's just pause for a moment and tell yeah. that story again. You got the wrong bag. No, so I was, I always work from the Sheraton downtown. Sure. Yeah. And uh, I was there and I, I had a phone call and it was a little noisy where I was sitting. So I got up and I moved where I could see my uh, laptop on the, on the uh, table, but I couldn't see my bag. But my bag, the only thing that of value in my bag is my laptop. So I'm like, all right, well, no one's going to take my empty sure. laptop bag. Right. So no one did take it. But what they did was they exchanged it with their uh, sort of felt black bag. With my beautiful black, oh my god, my beautiful leather bag, and uh, inside were several. Uh, there was a rosary, of course. So I knew it was a Catholic. Good, and there were but several. But not a good Catholic because no. they stole your bag. Well, they probably asked for forgiveness afterwards, and uh, several rings. And as long as they mean it, you can do anything. Exactly. Yeah, that's the beauty and of Catholicism. What happened was I I, I I I called to my my waiter who I know because I go there all the time. And he was a like, Mr. Davis, and they were able to look up and find my bag on CCTV. Wow. And return it to me, but I kept this ring to remind whoever took my bag that, uh, you know, I have this ring. So. so they stole your bag and you stole their rings. Well, I, I gave the, their bag back when I, my bag was right, returned. Right, You stole the ring that but you're wearing. I kept wearing, this ring, yeah. And you're wearing that ring on your married finger to say that you're married to the morality of stealing rings. <laughs> I am that, that you know. If somebody takes my bag, I'm gonna I'm gonna keep your ring in your unsuccessful bag heist. Well, so. we, we both brought some some serious travel stories today. I think Whoa. mine had a, a deep moral lesson. Mine did too. Yep. Always keep an eye on your bag, even if you think that no one's gonna take it. Maybe they will. That's right, and I'm definitely gonna keep an eye on my bag because I'm gonna always have. Uh, Eight different backup batteries, ten right. chargers, and maybe an extra iPhone. Because God, the idea of being without a phone, traveling without a phone, I didn't realize what a big deal it is. Yeah, I've I have gotten my phone uh, stolen multiple times. In stolen or lost? You lost? Uh, no, stolen. Well, stolen. I mean, you know. Um, so, uh, and and I've had to buy like one of those Huawei, those like uh, oh I mean, wow, yeah. the temp phones, yeah, the little yeah, burners. they're like twenty five dollars, yeah, right, right, yeah. And Grinder doesn't even work on that. Actually, that's a pretty good uh, that's a pretty good tip that if you lose your phone, there's you can at least uh, make it work. Get one of those cheap little boys. Totally. Well, not one of those cheap little boys. I didn't mean that. <laughs> I mean you can always get We're you can always, that. Yeah, you can always get a cheap little phone. All right. Well, uh, with that, I think it's time to take off because uh, we got to start exploring Gaudi's Barcelona. It's time to take off. Head to Barcelona. Tell the cabin crew. Cabin crew? Flight attendants, prepare for takeoff, please. All right, Ryan. Well, uh, today we are to, uh, we're going to Barcelona. You and I both uh, big fans of Barcelona. Um, uh, got a politically uncertain time there. Remember, they keep trying to separate from Spain every couple of years. Yeah, yeah, they, 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 they do want to become their own sort of country. Well, some folks do, not enough to actually do it, but it seems like it's quite a movement. No, well, I'll tell you who I think would have been uh, a fan of that movement, uh, and most likely is Antony Gaudi. Now, you know Gaudi. Uh, Gaudi was uh, the, sort of uh, the most famous architect that is uh, from Barcelona. He actually grew up just down the coast, uh, about 60 miles away, but, you know, he sort of came to fame uh, as a, a Catalan modernist architect. And uh, Catalonia, now that is the region that's trying to separate from the rest of Spain. That's right. And uh, Gaudi, I, we're going to talk through five different buildings that you can see when you visit Barcelona. And uh, we've been to, uh, we've each been to a couple of them. And, uh, you know, I, I think we'll probably start with the, the most famous one. But just to talk uh, for a moment, I thought we could maybe talk about what makes these buildings so spectacular. Yeah, I think that's I think that's a good idea because you know when I had been to Barcelona for the first time, I had heard uh, his name, you know, but I didn't actually have any concept of what made him such a fantastic architect. But all it takes is you know driving or walking past one of these buildings, even if you didn't know that it was built by a historic famous architect, it would take your breath away. Yeah, you would stop and be like, wow, why is this building so radically more interesting than every other building on this block? Right? So I mean, what 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 makes it so interesting? Well, I think, you know, the, the, the sort of like an inherent whimsy, you know, there's all these sort of circular kind of lines. It's like very much, you know, his buildings feel like they could be, they could be built on a cloud or something. There's a playfulness, a colorfulness. 
that sort of jumps out at you and it, and it does not look like any kind of traditional building from any period. That's right. And uh, by and large, especially as he went on in his career, he really started to embrace uh, bright colors, uh, different types of material you don't typically see in buildings, and uh, a lot of curves. I feel like when we're sort of trained when we see buildings to expect straight lines that look, you know, sturdy and, and beautifully engineered. But in fact, he really, he, his buildings almost look like sculptures. Well, they're like, they have, they like, they're bubbles, you know, like it looks like someone blew bubbles and they kind of were caught in mid, you know, mid, mid blow and they're sort of just kind of stationary. Is that, is that? Uh, I'm not sure I would pretend, <laughs> necessarily put it that way, but I do know what you mean. I mean, I think they look uh, kind of ethereal. The only other uh, comparison that I can think to make them, and, and again, I think the Instagram is going to be a, an important companion to, to today's, uh, to yeah. today's pod, because you're going to want to look and study these buildings, uh, uh, they almost look Dr. Seussian. The, the sort of otherworldliness of Dr. Seuss, uh, animals and shapes, that's what Gaudi looks like to me. Yeah, I can, I can see that. Um, there is like a magical sort of surreal element too that, that, that reminded me, I mean, sort of, sort of surrealist in a way. Yeah, and I, I, th I think the reason that it gets linked to Dr. Seuss in my mind is because Gaudi uh, really took inspiration from the animal and plant world. And when I think of Dr. Seuss, I think of all of his like kind of wild animal creations. And uh, th to me, Gaudi's buildings really look organic. Uh, like some of them look like sea life. Some of them look like dragons. Right. And um, it's interesting because uh, it, the, uh, the UNESCO World Heritage Organization actually uh, has, has recognized uh, in and around Barcelona seven different sites as protected uh, world heritage sites. So, uh, you know, Ryan, you and I are not alone. He's, he's not some sort of discovery we've made. No, but if you're in Barcelona, uh, some of the most beautiful things I saw there were, were his buildings. So high up on the list of anyone going to Barcelona are these, these, these attractions. And it may actually be a little too high up on the list uh, because uh, over tourism, which is a problem we, we mention fairly often on the pod, uh, that, that is starting to become an issue with the, the protection and viewing of uh, some of his more public works. Yeah, in fact, the, the, first, the first work we're going to talk about today was probably I had to buy tickets in advance several days and I was lucky to get in. Yeah, that's right. And just to give a sense of the time period, um, yeah. Gaudi moved to uh, Barcelona to study architecture in 1868. And Ryan, sort of his, his most iconic buildings, they stretch from uh, the 1880s straight through into the 1910s. That, that's, uh, well, that's generally the period we're talking about. Some of his buildings haven't even been finished yet. Well, one particularly, and that is uh, his most famous building. So why don't we just kick off with that? And it's called La Sagrada Familia, which of course means the Holy Family. Right. And that is uh, an absolutely extraordinary church uh, right in Barcelona. It began construction in 1883, and then Gaudi continued to work on it for four decades. And believe it or not, it is still not completed today. Yeah, the, the same folks who do the New York City subway, uh, apparently in charge. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, this, is, uh, this is Barcelona's greatest tourist attraction, over 10,000 visitors a day. It's actually been named by the Catholic Church as a basilica, which is the, the highest honor that the Catholic Church can give to any specific church. It's one of the holiest places in the Roman Catholic Church uh, forever and ever. And when you're, when you're in Europe and you're traveling around, you can get a little bit of a cathedral sort of, you know, get a little bored. You can see a lot of churches. Yeah, lot of you can get cathedraled out. Yeah. Now, I had assumed that I was cathedraled out on this specific trip, uh, and boy, was I wrong. It, it, one... You know, it was one of the most sort of striking, uh, one of the most striking churches I've ever been in by, by far, uh, and well worth the wait, um, both the, the outside and the inside, totally extraordinary. Yeah, it really, uh, so it, it, it's sort of a, a dull brownish color, and the facades famously look as if they are melting. Um, to me, they look like a sandcastle that's been kind of hit by a wave. It's sort of droopy, muddy looking. Um, and it's it, absolutely huge. I mean, I don't, I don't want to, the idea that it, it looks like organic material, to me, some, somewhat could suggest that it looks small. No. The final church is actually going to have uh, the Jesus Christ Tower. Fair enough. <laughs> good, name, good name for it. It's yeah. going to be 566 feet high, and that will make it Europe's tallest cathedral. So it's absolutely huge. Yeah, it's absolutely huge. And it's, it's actually hard to get a, uh, 
because of how sort of strange and quirky it is, and there's quite a few towers. I mean, from whatever angle you look at it from, it's sort of like an entirely different cathedral. Right. And, um, you know, like many cathedrals, it has a, a lot of sculpture on the outside. So, it, you know, it has a, a nativity facade. It has a passion facade. I think what makes it uh, really distinctive and why you can't get sort of cathedraled out from it is that it looks so uniquely inspired by nature. I know what, what really sticks with me is when you wait in the long line to finally get in, um, the, the columns inside really, really look like trees. And as they approach the ceiling, they sort of spread out into a canopy. And, and one of the things that I remember as well is the lighting that comes in through the windows. Uh, it's also supposed to make you feel like you are in a forest. So, um, you know, the, the color of the, of, the, of the light is astonishing and the sort of greenish tint to it, uh, it, you know, it feels like you're in sort of a surreal place. Yeah, and it's, uh, it's, it's been famously controversial. Uh, George Orwell said it was, quote, one of the most hideous buildings in the world. <laughs> An okay. opinion we don't seem to share. No. Um, nor 10,000 other tourists today. <laughs> um, and Salvador Dali actually said, those who have not tasted his superbly creative bad taste are traitors. So... <laughs> That's a sort of a mixed compliment there, I think. Well, it's such an odd thing to come from Dali. Right, who, who is not known for his sort of conservative taste. Yeah, exactly. And, yeah. and I, I, last time I, I checked, he also likes melting things. So. Yeah, I think, yeah. He's just upset that somebody f made physical his, his sort of like, you know, uh, what, he was, what he was painting. I do have, now I mentioned in a very early pod of ours, so this is going to be a deep cut for the loyal listeners. I had a friend named Albi who went to Barcelona, and he did not go to Sagrada Familia. And I uh, deeply shamed him for it. I'll continue to do it today. Um, because, of course, it was the very top recommendation that I had for him. So, uh, folks, if you go to Barcelona, even though I know the lines are long, go early, beat the crowds. You must, must, must go into Sagrada Familia. Yeah, I 100% agree. I think it is, it is one of the most sensational things you're going to see while you're in Spain. Just a few uh, fun facts. Gaudi actually is buried in the crypt. Um, yes. He famously died when he was hit by a trolley. And uh, he, he's in the crypt. Um, and, the, you know, there's a big anniversary up, Ryan. I actually really dream of us going to this together, which is the, the church is going to be completed in 2026. Do we really believe that? I do believe it. Um, I, that date has been hard and fast for a while. And it's also the centenary of Gaudi's death. So I think they're really aiming for that. Yeah. And by the way, if it's not actually done, who's going to know? You yeah, know? well, fair <laughs> point. They just say, no, 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 that's the uh, yeah, uh, that's yeah, art, art yeah. over there. <laughs> Um, well, another uh, just fun fact that I love about it is that uh, for about 100 years, uh, the city of Barcelona is saying that they were working without a uh, building permit. <laughs> um, really? Yeah, they're going after the sort of board and organization that is still building the museum by saying that they're building without a permit and that they have tons of back taxes and uh, uh, fees that they have to pay. The, the board, for what they're worth, says that is not true. They had a permit. That was signed in 1885 from Saint Marty de Provinciales, which was the name of the uh, city that the, that Sagrada Familia used to be in, and that was uh, subsequently subsumed into Barcelona. And they never got that Barcelona permit that they need. Yeah, but if you brought the plans for this cathedral to the to the building guy in Barcelona and you put it in front of him, he goes, "This is not going to stand. This is not you no, know. No, that's this looks crazy. Yeah, yeah, it looks yeah. crazy. However, uh, engineers do praise how solidly built it is. So no matter how organic it looks, there is great uh, engineering work as well. Quite a brilliant mind. Absolutely. So uh, to move on to uh, the the second destination we recommend, Sagrada Familia. That's that's an absolute must do. Number two is interesting because it's actually a public park. Um, so it's something that you can go to for fairly cheap. But because of that, it's also been uh, suffering due to over tourism. And there now is a section of the park that you do need to buy a timed ticket for. Um, so this is called uh, Park Guell. And uh, it was built uh, for, a, 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 as, as all the rest of these were, were for a, a wealthy patron, uh, somebody who was actually hiring Gaudi as their personal architect. And uh, it, it was uh, originally designed as sort of a closed off gated community where there would be a number of houses. Um, but Count Usebi Guell uh, actually perished. And then this opened in 1926 as a public park, which it, uh, it remains today, except for that monumental zone, which got closed off. And I, I have to say that made me really sad to hear that 
um, something that was a public park had to get timed. I know this is something I think about with our national parks, that this, uh, the, the, the outpouring of people who want to go see these places actually put what makes them special in danger. Yeah, but you you know they have to do what they have to do. If, I mean, Barcelona is one of the most popular cities to visit in in Europe, and if if folks are just so uncomfortable, if everything is so crowded, they're going to have to do time tickets. There's really no way around it. Yeah, no, I, I agree with you. Uh, it's better to do it and to save uh, what is special, right? And one of the most special things um, when you see this, <laughs> uh, you kind of say to yourself, "God, did Gaudi understand the idea of the selfie? Because it just looks made." to be selfied, which is as you uh, walk into this monumental zone area, there is a big lizard statue, like a huge lizard. And uh, it's affectionately called El Drac, which you could probably guess what that means. Dragon. A dragon, right. It's not technically a dragon. It's actually a giant lizard. I believe a salamander. Um, But it's made out of this beautiful, very colorful mosaic. What What is technically a dragon? Is curious, or you know? Well, I think a dragon has to be a... mythical. Oh, okay. well, I guess there is a kimono dragon. That's There's not a kimono mythical. dragon. There's also a dragon fly. You know, less. Well, I, lesson. I think we can agree it's not a dragon <laughs> fly. I, I, but you said technically a dragon, like there's like there's some kind of test you could run on a non-dragon versus a dragon. All right. I just think when you see this, it doesn't look like it's going to spit fire. It looks like no. it's going to skitter away. Not all dragons have to spit fire. I remind you. Season six, Game of Thrones. I, ice. I, I don't. I don't watch uh, Game of Thrones. This mosaic that uh, the lizard is made out of. This this uh, is sort of one of the the quintessential traits of uh, of uh, Gaudi architecture, which is the breaking of tiles that is then implanted into a cement. And so uh, once you see one of these, you'll you'll get to really understand the style, and then you can start spotting a lot of buildings made by him because it repeats this effect of breaking beautiful, colorful objects and then embedding them together. So, uh, you know, I didn't actually get a chance to, to visit this park when I was in Barcelona. So I am super excited to go back and to you know, get my time ticket so I can te- check out El Drac. Absolutely. But you did uh, get to go uh, actually on the inside of a tour of one of his houses. Isn't that right? Yeah, I had the opportunity to uh, tour Casa Batyo. Oh, yes. Uh, and by the way, for those uh, who, who want to Google these later... That is uh, Casa, C-A-S-A, which is the same in Spanish and Catalan. And uh, Batllo is B-A-T-L-L-O. That's what it looks like, uh, but it pronounced Batllo. And this is actually a place that you can, uh, you can buy a ticket. I actually bought the ticket day of uh, for a few hours later. So uh, not many people can go in because it's an apartment complex uh, that he designed. But they do let you go in on sort of a time tour. Uh, and you get to sort of start at the top and go all the way down in this sort of phenomenally strange apartment building uh, built by him where there are these these bubble windows. There's this sort of interior staircase that goes sort of all the way down. And they have this really weird, uh, Karen, I didn't like it at all. They had this VR component Mm. where uh, they gave you these, uh, you know, these like sort of audio tours, but you could sort of look through the screen and it would show you what the rooms would look like um, if they had furniture in them. Oh, dear. Um, the problem is that everybody in the, in the whole house, instead of like looking around at these, like this incredibly weird room that we're in, that doesn't look like any kind of room that you've been in is like obsessed with like looking at it through their, their right. phone device. Right, and so right. they're like barely paying attention to the, uh, the room that they're in. And they're sort of immersed in this sort of like AR video game that they're playing on, uh, on their phone. So I, I wouldn't. I don't think that that added a whole lot to the experience. You know, you can imagine what a couch looks like. It wasn't even like a couch he designed. So, right, right, yeah. So it's like, what would it look like with really bad furniture? <laughs> you know, not super helpful. It's much more interesting, I think, to sort of spend your time, sort of kind of engage in the space. How weird the lighting is. How interesting the the windows are. Um, you know, imagining being able to look over that incredible road uh, from the from sort of the main living area. Uh, it's a really impressive small building you know probably only like 30 or 40 people can be in it at a time so you kind of get you kind of get to feel what it'd be like to, to live in one of these houses yeah that's uh, you and i have both done some work with museums and i think we both can agree that uh, they're sometimes uh blinded by the want to inject tech into them yeah. and it sounds like uh if you go don't 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 take the electronic equipment with you yeah you don't you don't need to see what it would look like with an ikea couch right it's, you're fine and uh casa bet yo was built between 1904 and 1906 and uh, what I find uh, really interesting is that locally it is known as the House of Bones. 
And that's because from the outside, it looks very skeletal. It does, yeah. It does look. It does look very skeletal, uh, and it and it is sort of in a uh, a street that's sort of beautiful, but everything else is sort of more traditional. So when you're walking down the street, even if you didn't know it was there, you would it would immediately pop up. Like, what is this weird? Yeah, it looks like a like haunted house. Haunted house. It looks just. <laughs> yeah. It looks like a haunted house of you take a little bit of acid or something because it's sort of like it's all kind of wobbly. It's like, am I a little dizzy or is this house sort of look? You yeah, know. I to me these this this house looks uh, like an Edward Gore like if Edward Gorey was an architect more gory than Seuss absolutely yeah exactly yeah. this is the darker edge and my, one of my particular favorite uh, pieces is if you look at the the arched roof it is clearly meant to look like the spine of some sort of reptile it's got uh, sort of this arched uh, look of uh, of well coming back to sort of a dragon there's definitely a theme that runs through these these more mature works. Totally. And that's, that is, you can actually go up to the top to the roof. So you actually kind of can see that up close too. It's a pretty cool thing. Very neat. And do you remember how uh, in advance you had to book? I actually booked that day, but I'm, I would recommend, uh, you know, I lucked out. I think you should probably get it in advance on the website. Yeah. You didn't have to become a member for like $800. <laughs> no, I did not. I did not. Um, but I, I actually found, I, I was obsessed with getting a photo of the front that was remotely as interesting as actually being there and looking at it. And I, I could not capture with my phone anything that like remotely resembled the kind of like wildness of the, of the front of the, of the building. So, well, it it's just really goes back to, to your point of, uh, you know, soak it in, study it with your eyes and don't let a screen get in the way because really totally. it's, it's impossible to capture how neat these buildings are. Yeah. Yeah. And the light from the windows, it's super unique. You can't really, you can't capture it. Yeah, and so uh, the the next house, the the fourth building that we want to talk about is called Casa Mila, and again, it was built for uh, wealthy patrons, the the Mila family, and uh, this one also has kind of a cute nickname. Uh, locally, it's called La Pradrera or the Stone Quarry, um, and that's because uh, the the front has this sort of undulating stone facade, and uh, and it and it it's only really interrupted by these. Um, sort of uh, iron work balconies. So this to me, and I didn't know this was his until uh, I, I looked into it more when I first walked by it. Uh, I thought of it as like the Flintstone building. Yeah, you know? right, right. It yeah. does look a, a little more primitive uh, than, than <laughs> now what made you think of the Flintstone? It just, I mean, if you, if you look at it, it's just, it looks kind of like something that Fred Flintstone would have lived in if it was like an apartment building, you know? It was like, it's sort of just like, Primitive is right, but it sort of just looks like it's been sort of stone stacked up, you know, on top of each other. It's, yeah, well, I mean, I think uh, Fred Flintstone worked in a stone quarry, yeah, so yeah. it makes sense that that's what it's called. He had he didn't have this kind of taste, but I think that if he had been a little more inspired, he would have. This would have been his. Yeah, I, I uh, read in an architect's uh, description of this building that called it a sea creature spaceship. So. <laughs> I, you know, I think words sort of fail with uh, such unique uh, buildings. And this was this was the uh, the last uh, private residence that he that he, uh, that he designed, and it was built between 1906 and 1912. So this is actually later in his career. That's right. And um, to your point about just like how you could actually go on a tour up to the roof, you can also take a guided tour here and get up to the roof. And that's actually one of the most spectacular parts of Casa Mila, because on the roof. You get the top of six skylights and staircase entrances, four domes, two vent covers, and 28 chimneys. And he paid a lot of attention into making each of these look like a sculpture themselves. Yeah, that's just, it's the same exact thing on the, on the roof of, of his other place where there's all, everything is sort of perfectly designed. The, the skylights are designed, you know, everything is designed. There's not a moment where he's just like, Eh, I'll just, yeah, just make it look like a chimney. No, no. <laughs> he didn't. He didn't leave it up to the workshop assistants <laughs> to just like I don't know, make make sure the the smoke comes out. He did not. No, no, no. And uh, what what's particularly notable on Casamilla is the chimneys are so sinister looking that uh, they are called witch scarers. In other words, they're so horrible looking that even witches would be scared of them. They are very strange. We're going to have to put that on the Insta. Absolutely. And uh, Ryan, to your point, this was the, the last private residence to, he designed. And with that, I think we should end with the, the first house he designed, which was commissioned in 1877, and it's called Casa Vicens. And uh, what's, it was built for a stockbroker. But what's really interesting about it is that it, it only became open to the public in 2017. So this is actually a house that neither you nor I have had the chance to go see. 
And uh, it, it really uh, throws into relief how uh, creative Gaudi became as he went further on in his career. Because when you look at this house, while it is extraordinarily beautiful, it does not reflect this kind of wild Willy Wonka uh, organic flowy style that we've been describing. It almost looks Turkish in the in the tile style. Yeah, well, that is a uh, Moorish influence, which uh, is very uh, prevalent in the south part of, of Spain. Gotcha. And um, believe it or not, it was still a private home up to 2014. And uh, I will I will include in the uh, show notes a, a quick little great New York Times article where they interviewed the person who had to move out of the house <laughs> in order for it to become public. Um, and he had some great stories about finding tourists just kind of like intruding into the yard and even into the living room. Um, because <laughs> it does have a lot of artistic touches. I mean, this was clearly an architect who was also an artist, uh, but his full, uh, his full signature style had not yet bloomed this early. So there are colorful tiles. There's really ornate brickwork. Um, and there also is a certain respect for nature, but often it found itself uh, portrayed as simply uh, images, painted images of actual nature included into the house. This is, I am, I am, this is so interesting to me that this was not available to tour until 2017. So uh, not that many people have gotten a chance to see this yet. Right. So uh, it's, it's uh, ripe for the visiting uh, next time that you're in Barcelona. Did the did the gentleman give this up, or did was uh, did the state say you know we should we should be showing this house? Uh, no, right. It wasn't actually bought out by the state just for sort of cultural reasons. It was actually bought by an investment company called Armora Capital, uh, which sees it as uh, a potentially lucrative uh, investment. Which I have to say they're not wrong about it um, well, because uh, you know you, I, I would happily pay for the ticket price uh, for admission. Yeah, I mean, it's much better that it's owned by at least folks who want to have the public come see it. Yeah, and so basically uh, it was owned by this private uh, family, the Herrero Jover family, and, uh, it, and, and now it's, it's been open to the public uh, as a museum. Great. Well, it, you know, it's nice to hear of uh, big corporations opening their doors every once in a while. Absolutely. You know, those private, the, the market's always, <laughs> always in the right. <laughs> the one thing I want to call out that you should look for if you do go is try to spot all the places where uh, Gaudi let the natural world come into the interior of the house. Um, apparently, during the uh, some renovation projects, a lot of the art had been covered up. And in the, in the restoration, uh, we are now able to see painted images of pomegranates and passion flowers and uh, a lot of palms and things that were already in the nature that was directly surrounding the house when it was built um, is portrayed inside. And that includes sort of visually tricky paintings that make you think that you're looking outside when in fact you're looking at a painting. And, you know, uh, he designed a lot of stuff in Barcelona, but there's, there are many houses and palaces and, and churches that he uh, designed outside of Barcelona, all over Spain, um, that, uh, you know, you and I have not been to, but that, that are, you know, look fantastic. So this, this was an incredibly prolific uh, architect. Well, Ryan, we're, we're saving that for our future episode, Gaudi's Spain outside <laughs> of Barcelona. I think that's coming in season two. Season two. So uh, just one more quick rundown of all the places we talked about today. If you're heading to Barcelona, there are, there are seven sites uh, that you can see, but the five that we talked about it today, you got to go to La Sagrada Familia. Absolutely uh, a world-famous uh, cathedral, uh, actually a basilica. By the way, I don't think I mentioned, made a basilica by Pope Benedict, the still-living oh. Pope Benedict, the backup pope. The backup pope. I love that pope. Yeah, actually, do, I'm only, do you? No, I'm only. Okay. <laughs> I like the current pope, all right. Um, then you should go to Parkwell, uh, and this is a place that you can see for free unless you want to get into that, uh, that specific monumental zone. And then uh, three house tours, Casa Batio, Casa Mila, and Casa Vicens, which has only been open to the public since 2017. And if you visit all of these, you will really see the evolution of Gaudi's particular style. And also, we should mention, even if you can't get tickets to the interior of those, you should swing by while you're in town because... You get a lot of this just from being able to see the exterior. Yeah, I totally agree. These are all worth seeing, even if you just have time to see the exterior that you will not forget. We want to thank Anthony Gowdy for uh, really creative architecture. Yeah, thank you, Anthony. 
And w- Ryan, <laughs> when you and I go to Sagrada Familia in 2026, we can we can visit the grave and pay a tribute. I would love that. Yeah, when they finally finish it in 2026, we will uh, we'll be there. I wonder if the grave is really like weird and organic looking. I hope it looks like he's like emerging from it. <laughs> Do you, you think, yeah, he probably he might rise in 2026. Maybe this is what he's been waiting for. Oh, so you're suggesting he's the second coming. I don't know. Well, <laughs> you've always been a fan of the second coming. <laughs> oh. Well, uh, with that, Kiernan, I think it's time for the last stop. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the last stop on this train. Everyone, please leave the train. So, Ryan, uh, the last stop. Uh, is the segment where you and I each talk about one thing that we've uh, experienced in the past week. Maybe we ate something, maybe we did something, maybe we saw something, maybe we smelt something, maybe we cooked something. And it's all about uh, keeping the spirit of travel alive in the workaday week, feeding that spirit of wanderlust that we celebrate here on Out of Office. And of course, it's uh, broadly known, more popularly known as the people segment, the last stop. Ryan, I'm going to kick it off this week, sort of shake things up. You usually grab the first spot in the last stop. I'm going to do the first last stop. So uh, the first last stop for me this week is uh, I went to the, the Boston Museum of Fine Arts, great uh, fine arts museum, and they have a, uh, an exhibit called Frida Kahlo and Arte Popular. And uh, this runs uh, only a little bit longer to June 19th. And uh, so if you're in the Boston area, you definitely want to take it in. What I like about it is it is a, a bite-sized uh, uh, show. It's not one of these giant encyclopedic shows. You can go, you can see it in a quick hour. And uh, what it's about is uh, how Frida Kahlo was inspired by and deeply loved Mexican folk art. And so it both uh, does a nice job of displaying folk art and also the, the type of folk art that she collected and uh, teaches you not only about that rich tradition, but then also has works by Frida Kahlo that included portrayals of this sort of art. So, Ryan, you, having spent a lot of time in Mexico, uh, probably are familiar with this sort of art. You've got things like the Day of the Dead art that we picture, sort of humorous dolls and portrayals of skeletons. Um, It has devotional objects um, called retablos, which are uh, small paintings that show miracles or uh, prayerful moments. Uh, They're meant to sort of uh, show thanks to God for taking some action. Um, and also everything from toys to vases to buckets that are painted with, um, uh, Mexican flowers, Mexican animals. And it's super fascinating to see, you know, Frida Kahlo was such a constructed personality, right? Like she very much wanted to per- be perceived in a certain way. She would dress. She was a brand. Yeah, she was a brand. Exactly. She really was a brand. And, um, th- that, what really comes across is what she was looking to, f- to for inspiration for that brand. Uh, so it's fun to see the source material. They even have some of the clothing there. Um, the one complaint I would have about it is I wish it was twice as large because I really love this Mexican folk art. And uh, I could I, I think it's fun. I think it's colorful. Um, I, also, I love the idea that it's, uh, it's, it's art that is within means. You could travel to Mexico and buy art like this today without spending thousands and thousands of dollars. I, I even have a couple of pieces of Day of the Dead art that are some of my favorite souvenirs. Yeah, and, uh, you know, it actually tied into this, uh, last uh, week when I was in Mexico City, uh, I went for the first time to the Museum of Popular Art, Museo. Is this your last stop? Yeah, it's oh, my last stop. I, I guess Ryan's bullying me into his last stop. So, All right, so I'm, I'm looking at Frida Kahlo and, and folk art. What, what are you doing? So uh, I went to uh, the Museum of, of, of Popular Art in, in Mexico City. Oh, wow. Um, a, a really smart, good-looking person must have told you to do that. Well, you uh, told me that I should check it out. I, of course, had it on my list long before. Um, Ooh, oh, but you had just missed it the 15 times before uh, you that know, you had been to Mexico City. Uh, you got you to gotta, you gotta take these things slow, folks. You don't want to do everything. <laughs> um, but they've got they, they, a lot of this uh, Day of the Dead art that, that you speak of. And they also have, and I, I'm going to try not to butcher the name here, um, but there are these sort of uh, fantastical creatures uh, that are Mexican sculptures, and they're called alabrijes. Alabrijes. Ah, Kieran, you're so good. Your oh. Spanish is so good. Oh. Uh, this is actually uh, a, a type of art that was invented by a guy named Pedro Linares. In the 1930s, he, uh, he passed out, and he was, had a fever dream, and he saw a donkey with butterfly r- wings, sure. a rooster with bullhorns, sure. A lion with an eagle's head. Absolutely. And all of them were shouting that word, 
Albrige, Albrige. Alabrijes. Alabrijes. Alabrije. Alabrije. Why don't I just say it? Because you can't yeah. say it. Okay. Alabrije. They were all saying Alabrije over and over again. Exactly. And that's when he started to make these creatures. And so uh, that's another thing that you see when you're at the, the Popular Art Museum. In addition to the sort of the Day of the Dead stuff, the more, the more traditional sort of Mexican stuff, you're going to see these really fantastic myth- mythical creatures that look like they could be pulled out of Harry Potter or something. I mean, they're really fantastic. Oh, yeah. I, do know, I've, I've long wanted one of, uh, on my shelf, and I did not get one when I was in Mexico City, and I really regret yeah. it. For Frida was a big, Frida and Diego were huge fans of, of, this, uh, of this style, and they had many in their house. And, of course, uh, for those uh, who, who are ha- having a hard time picturing Alabrijes, if you saw uh, Coco, uh, the, 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 sure. the, the Disney movie. Uh, the Great a- film. A- we recommend it. Very fun. And uh, one of the inspirations they took was having all these uh, mystical, mythical-looking creatures, and they were alabrijes. And one of my other favorite pieces of art in the uh, in the Popular Art Museum is a bullfighting ring. Oh, it's the best. I know exactly right. the one you're talking about. Where all the audience in attendance is uh, a skeleton. And, and the bull is a skeleton. Yes. yes. Yeah, you took a video of that, right? I did, yeah. We can right. post oh my it God. On. We this week is just going to be a landmark oh, Instagram week. So much Instagram I'm thinking, content. I'm thinking two posts a day. Whoa. Well, I'll send you some stuff, dude. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, uh, boy, this, I'll tell you, this, this episode really did inspire my wonderlust. I feel huh. like uh, studying up on Spanish. I think I'm going to go do a little Duolingo. Yeah. Can you say that word one more time for me? Alabrije. Alabrije. Brije. Oh, oh God. Uh, Alabrije. I'm going to do some Duolingo right after this. Yeah, I think you need to work on I'll it. I'll start with English, and then I'm going to work. I'm going to, I'm going to add it to the list that I have been keeping of words Ryan can't pronounce. <laughs> and it all started with Cheshire Cat. Cheshire Cat. <laughs> uh, Ryan, uh, I hope you can pronounce. What are we talking about next week? So people love our episode about historic houses in America. I get phone calls about it. I get texts. I get emails. How'd they um, find your can, phone number? <laughs> I mean, people just need to, need to talk people about this. People did like it. People did yeah, like so it. what we're going to do is we're going to expand. We're going to talk about more historic houses in America that, that you and I recommend folks go to you know, feel good about the, the, the beautiful, cool stuff we have going on here in America. Absolutely. We're going we're gonna to talk historical houses part two next time on Out of Office. Until then, I'm Ryan Davis. And I'm Kiernan Schmidt. And this is Out of Office, a travel podcast. Is he taken? I want one of those little mythical, kind of like fantastical creatures. Like yeah, I've half, always... Half I, dog, half snake. See, I, see, that one doesn't sound as cool to me. I want like half frog, half ant. Really? <laughs> yeah. That would be a conflicted, a conflicted animal. Uh, you yeah, know? I mean, you want flies and you want ants. <laughs>